How many of you know Jesus is still alive? Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is still alive. Because Jesus is still alive, you know, Easter was three weeks ago, and amazing, Jesus is still alive. But actually, he walked out of the tomb 2,100 years ago, and he's still alive. Amen? And because he's alive, we are healed and set free. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about forgiveness. And so what I want you to do, if you've got a Bible with you, I want you to turn to John chapter 21. John 21, the very last chapter of the Gospel of John. And we've kind of been working our way through the last few characters of the Gospel of John. And characters is the right word. Amen? Because, man, they were some characters. They'd have fit in right here at New Hope Church. Amen? Or maybe we'd have fit in with them. I'm not sure which is which, but probably some of both. We talked two weeks ago about Mary Magdalene, how Mary Magdalene came to the tomb looking for Jesus' body, and what she found was hope. Amen? And when she, we, we talked last week, Pastor Dan talked last week about Thomas, and, and Thomas showed up to the disciples and found out that, that Jesus had come to them, and he didn't believe them. Remember, there was fear and there was doubt. And then Jesus showed up to him and said, you don't need to doubt and fear anymore because I'm alive. Amen? And so, guys, not only do we have hope, and not only can we wipe away doubt and fear because Jesus is alive, but this morning what we're going to learn is that because he's alive, we can find forgiveness. Amen? Who needs some forgiveness in this room? All right. So, like most of you, good. My guess is probably all of us. Amen? And so we're in John chapter 21, and I want to ask you a question before we jump into the story. How many of you have any regrets in your life? Yeah, almost all of us. The truth is, uh, I hear from people all the time that they don't have any regrets because, because you know what, there's no point in having a regret. No point in regretting anything. It was life, it's past, blah, 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 blah. But can I tell you what's real? What's real is I have regrets. There are some things in my life that I wish I could redo. Anybody else? Yeah. And so let me give you a couple examples. There are some things that, that seem really not that significant, but I'd still like to redo them. For example... I wish I'd played sports in high school. Now, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Oh, well, good. Thank you. It's because I look like such an athlete, right? Say amen. amen. Bunch of liars, I'm telling you. <laughs> no, so I wish I'd played sports in high school, and the reason I wish I'd played sports in high school is because as I look back on it, I think, man, my eating habits would be so different today if I had played sports in high school, probably, right? Right? I probably would have different exercise routines in my life. I'd probably have some exercise routines in my life if I had played sports in high school, right? I probably wouldn't have the health issues that I wrestle with today if I had played sports in high school. And so to be, to be honest with you, I wish if I could go back and do it again, I probably would have done something of an athletic nature in high school. Now, I don't think about it that much. I mean, in fact, it popped into my head as I was thinking about this message, and probably the time I thought about it before that was years ago, right? I just don't think about it very often, but every once in a while I do, and when I do, I regret it. I kind of wish I could go back and do it over again, but it's done and I move on, right? But there are some things in my life, if I'm being honest, that I regret a whole bunch more. There are some things in my life that I look back and I think about a whole lot that, I, that I've spent years trying to fix and redo and to get right. Do you know what I'm talking about? Let me give you an example of that. I, I was a jerk to my siblings growing up. I'm not a jerk to my siblings anymore. I might still be a jerk, but not to my siblings, right? <laughs> growing up, I was a jerk to my siblings. I treated them really poorly, and we have a pretty strained relationship today, and I think in large part because of the way I treated my siblings. And i got to be honest with you, I would love to go back and redo that. I'd love to go back and fix that and figure out how to fix it. The truth is my pride gets in the way so often when I have opportunities to try and fix it and redo it that I just can't bring myself to do the things I probably need to do, and I don't know why. But i got to be honest with you, I'd like to redo it. I'd like to fix it. I'd like to go back and do it all over again. As you look at your life, as you look at where you've been, at what you've done, at the things that you haven't done, what are the things you'd like to redo? What are some of the things that you'd like to fix? What are the relationships you wish you could go back and start over on? See, we all have regrets, right? 
We all would like some do-overs. We all have some things we'd like to just push the do-over button on and the reset button on and start all over again. And whether we like it or not, many of these things have shaped the way that we live right now. They've shaped the way that we think right now and who we're becoming, and many of them are still shaping us today. Amen? I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how to love people and do a better job of that. I'm still trying to figure out how to treat people better on the, uh, than the way that I treated my kid brothers and sisters growing up. And in that way, it's a good thing that I went through that. But in some ways, these broken relationships keep me from moving forward. Amen? These broken things in my life, these things that I wish I could have a redo on, these things that I wish I could fix, stop me in my tracks and they keep me from going to the places I need to go. Right? There are still things hanging out there that I just don't know how to fix things that I need to make amends for that my pride and my fear keep me from fixing. Can you relate to that? Anybody in this room? Yeah. Now, as I think about some of those things and some of those relationships, it gets me to thinking about my relationship with God. And of all the people that I've broken relationship with, of all the broken relationships I've had to deal with in my life, God's the one I feel like I violate more than anything. See, over and over again, I let him down and I disappoint him. Over and over again, I hurt him. How often have I, have I abandoned him and done exactly what I said I wouldn't do? How often have I gone to him and asked him to forgive me for something that I ran back and did all over again, over and over and over? I mean, it's like this horrible cycle and pattern in my life that I keep doing. And then finally, I get to the place so many times that I struggle to keep going back. I find many times that I find myself saying, in some ways, I just don't want to do, I don't want to do this anymore because I don't think God has any more forgiveness left for me. Have you ever felt that before? Yeah, like it can't be possible that God would still forgive me. He's, I've blown it so many times, and so I throw up my hands and surrender to the things that hold me down and keep me from moving forward. Yeah. I have regrets in my life. And what I'm learning is that I need some forgiveness in my life. Amen? that I need to know that I'm forgiven, and then I need to turn around and give it away if I'm ever going to experience the abundant life that God made for me to live. And so what, the reason I bring all that up is because the story that we're going to read together today is a story about a guy who knew about regrets. How many of you remember the name Peter? Peter, if there was ever anybody who knew about regrets, it was a guy named Peter. Peter was, a, I told you he was a character, right? Peter was a character who, he was stubborn, he was bullheaded, he was a fisherman who, who, when he jumped into something, he was all in. For Peter, it was all or nothing. Everything was all or nothing, right? When he committed to something, he was all in. And that's what it was like when he responded to his call to follow Jesus, right? He was on the front line of all the great things that Jesus did. He watched him as he performed miracles. He listened as he taught some of the great things that he taught. He, he watched on the front line in the big moments of Jesus' ministry, all the miracles and all the healings and everything. And he was the first person in line to respond to all of Jesus' questions and challenges. And he wasn't as afraid to put himself out there. It's kind of exciting if you think about it, right? I mean, he was all in. Totally, completely committed to Jesus. and I mean, I'm drawn to him because I love the way he lived his life. But just just as much as he was was all into this stuff, he felt like he he would jump all into all this stuff, but then when he he got into a bad spot, he would go all into that. Right? There's this great story where Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Peter, at some point along the way, you're going to deny me. You're going to betray me. Right? And Peter, he was, he was furious about this. In fact, he cussed Jesus out over the deal, right? He's like, what the heck are you talking about? I mean, you know, you know I'm all into this, Jesus. You know I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. I'll do whatever it takes. I will die for you. Do you remember that? Those were Peter's words to Jesus. He was, he was sold out and wanted to follow Jesus to the ends of the earth until it was time. And then maybe you remember the story in the courtyard where Peter is there, and he'd followed Jesus from the garden as Jesus was marched into Pilate's chambers. And there he was in the garden, in the, in the courtyard, by the fire. And three different times he's asked, aren't you a follower of Jesus? And, and every time he denied knowing him. Imagine the pain when he realized that what Jesus had told him was going to happen, happened. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to say it, Doug. Yeah, he did. Anybody felt like a fool in this room where Jesus was concerned? Yeah. That's where Peter was, right? 
He, he had done exactly what Jesus said he was going to do. Imagine the emotions when Peter denied knowing Jesus for that third time in the courtyard. Luke twenty two sixty two describes Peter's reaction. He said, Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. That's where Peter was, right? I mean, Peter had some regrets, don't you think? Yeah, he did. I mean, think he, you think he was sorry for what he'd done? I mean, if there was somebody in life who knew about regret, it was Peter. Somebody who wanted a do-over in life, it was Peter. And the next couple of days must have been torture for this guy, right? I mean, as Jesus is on his way to the cross, Peter's nowhere to be found. The guy who loved him, who claimed to love him and be all into him more than anybody. Right? As Jesus was hanging from the cross, Peter was nowhere to be seen. And as Jesus was taking his last breath, there was no Peter. Peter was ashamed. Peter was afraid. So Peter found himself run away from the situation. He was all into being all out at this point because he knew he'd hurt Jesus and there was nothing he could do to fix it. He had some serious regrets, right, church? Kind of like some of us. we got some serious regrets in life, right? But then the first day of the week rolled around, and Peter is deep in thought. He's trying to figure out what went wrong. He's trying to figure out what he could have done differently. He can't sleep. He can't eat. He's got all the emotions that every one of us has been through, right? And then all of a sudden, Mary Magdalene and the women, they show up, and they bust through the door, and they're like, listen, we've seen Jesus alive. Can you imagine the, what's going on in Peter's mind at this point? How excited he is? He races out of the house, and he's one of the first ones to the tomb, and he gets there, and he's looking. He's asking all these questions. What's happened, and, and is it true? Is he really gone? And, and if so, what, do, what happened? Did he really rise from the dead? Is he really alive? And for the first time in three days, Peter's got hope. For the first time in three days, Peter thinks, maybe I can get this right. For the first time in three days, Peter's thinking about a second chance. Amen? Because it didn't seem possible three days ago. It didn't seem possible that, that he was going to get a second chance, but here he was with an opportunity to make this right, and that's, what, that's where we pick up John chapter 21. Peter has now seen Jesus twice, and both times he missed an opportunity. And that takes us to John 21. Starting in verse 1, this is what it says. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples between, beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Somebody want to go with Peter? I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said, and so they went out onto the boat, but they caught nothing all night. And at dawn, Jesus is standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was, and he called out to them, hey, fellas, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. And so they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Amen. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. He jumped into the water, and he headed to the shore. The others stayed with the boat. They pulled the, load net to the, the, the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. And when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish that you've just caught, Jesus said. And so Simon Peter went aboard, and he dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. And this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. Now here's where it gets good. Verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. This story 
is a story about forgiveness. It's a story about the pain and the shame and the, and the regret that we live with and, and how because Jesus is alive, we can be set free. Amen? We can find forgiveness. If you're struggling with regret this morning, if you have some pain or some shame about past behavior in your life that you cannot shake and you need to be forgiven this morning, then this story is for you. Amen? This story is for you. And here's why this story is for you, church. The story is for you because, because first of all, what you need to know is that if you're not careful, regret will drive you to the comfortable things in your life, even when the comfortable things in your life will kill you. The comfortable things in your life can sometimes kill us, right? And regret will drive us back to those comfortable places. We need to know that. We need to be aware of it if we're ever going to get to a place where we're not in regret anymore. Amen? Regret will drive us to the comfortable things in our lives, even when the comfortable things in our lives will kill us. I want you to look back at verse 3 for a moment. Peter is hurting, and he's searching, and he's longing to make things right with Jesus, and he's had a couple of opportunities, the Bible tells us, because Jesus showed up to the disciples. He's had a couple of opportunities to, to, to try and get this right with Jesus, and he's missed them. And so here he is, and the Bible says that I don't know, I don't know whether Peter just, just didn't have a chance to get Jesus by himself or if he was afraid and he was ashamed. I don't know because I've been in both of those places before, amen? But what I do know is that when, it, when the rubber met the road and when he was in pain, Peter ran back to the thing he knew the best. He got on a boat and went fishing. Now, here's the thing. Fishing on the surface is no big deal, right? We all like to, well, some of us like to fish. Somebody say amen, amen. right? Some of us like to go fishing, and it's, you know, for Peter, it was just the thing to do, right? He knew how to fish. He, he'd been fishing his whole life. It was his profession. His father taught him how to fish, and his father's father had fished before him, and his dad before that. I mean, it was the family business. It's all he'd ever known, right? But what I find interesting was that in his pain and his frustration, that it was the very first place that Peter ran, he went back to the boat. He went back to the fishing, right? And it occurred to me, that's exactly what every single one of us does. That when we're in pain, that when we're living with shame, that when we've got bad things happening in our lives, the first thing we do is we run to the thing that brings us comfort. Amen? We run to that thing in our life that brings comfort into our lives, right? We go back to the old behavior, even if the old behavior isn't all that bad. Now, the truth is, fishing on its surface isn't a big deal at all. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with going fishing, except that if, if fishing is a, is a tool for us to run away, then it becomes a problem. Amen? See, sometimes those things that we run to, those comfortable things, those things that, that help us hide from the things that have held us back for too long are okay for us, and they're okay, and they're healthy on the surface, but sometimes they're super destructive, and in either case, they're, we're running away from something. Amen? Peter was running away from, from the pain and the guilt and the shame of the situation he'd run into with Jesus just three days earlier or three weeks earlier, and his pain drove him back to the comfortable thing, right? His pain drove him back to that comfortable place because regret will sometimes drive us back to the comfortable places in our lives even when those things could kill us, right? And so the question this morning is this, what's the comfortable thing that you keep running back to? And why do you keep running there? For me, it's work. That sounds weird, maybe. But that's what I do. I run back to work, right? I go and I work myself to death, and I, and I just keep, keep, the, I keep burying my pain and my shame by working more and more and more and more, right? But what I found is that, that it doesn't really matter how much I work, how much I work, how much I work, because that pain and that shame never really goes away no matter how hard I work that day. Because I'm not really dealing with the problem, amen? And inherently, there's nothing wrong with a good day's work, except at the end of the day, if I haven't dealt with my problem, then guess what? The problem's still there. But it sure is comfortable. We all run to the comfortable things in our lives when we find ourselves in shame and regret, and the truth is, those things will sometimes kill us. Now, here's something else I learned from this story. Regret can cause us to forget who and what we are. Regret can cause us to forget who and what we are. I want you to go back with me to the beginning of the Gospel of John for just a minute. 
you probably remember a little bit of the beginning of the story in John chapter 21 because it happened right at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Peter is doing what Peter does. He fishes, right? And he's out there, and he's fishing with his buddies, and they're fishing away, and they'd had a long night, and they didn't catch anything. Does it sound familiar yet? And they're on that boat, and they wake up the next morning, and they're just exhausted, and they haven't brought in anything. And Jesus, who at this point, they don't know who he is, standing on the shore, hollers out to them, Hey, boys, why don't you toss to the other side and see what happens? Now, you're a fisherman. What do you think about that? Who the heck's this guy think he is? Right? What's he know about fishing? But it occurred to them they got nothing. So let's give it a shot. And so they toss it to the other side. And the Bible says that, the, that their net began to rip because they couldn't contain all the fish. And in that moment, they knew that Jesus was somebody more than just an ordinary guy. Amen? And so Jesus, in response to them, says to them, he says, listen, I want you to follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. You remember that story? Jesus called them out of their old life into a brand new life. He gave them a new identity. He gave them a new opportunity. And now they weren't just fishermen. They had a new call. They had a new profession. They were fishers of men. Amen? They were called to do something else. And Peter, along the way, when he, when he got caught up in the, in the cycle of regret and shame and pain and all of that stuff, he forgot who he was. Right? He forgot that God had called him to, to something else. He forgot that Jesus had led him out of the old life into a brand new life, that he was a follower of Jesus first, and that was his new identity. And all of a sudden, when he was caught up in the pain, he went to the only place he knew. He forgot who he was. And he forgot what he was supposed to be doing. Amen? And church, the reality is regret does that to us, doesn't it? It'll consume us to the point that we don't know who we are anymore. We forget what it is we're supposed to be doing. It's been the problem since the beginning. You probably remember the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, man, they got everything. They're the prize of God's creation, right? And God says, here, you got a whole garden. You can have anything you want except this one thing. One thing. Just stay away from the one thing. It's all you got to do. And they couldn't do it because we can't do it either, can we? We blame them, but the reality is we'd have done it too, right? We'd have gone after the same apple or a fruit or whatever the fruit was, right? Adam and Eve, they ran after the fruit, and the moment they did it, they realized they'd done something they knew they weren't supposed to do, though they probably knew before. And so there they were, living with regret and shame and pain in their life. In fact, so much so that they they tried to hide from God. You remember that? What were they doing? They forgot who they were. They forgot what they were supposed to be doing, right? And it happens all the time. It happened with the Israelites over and over again, and it happens with us. We forget that we are God's children. We forget that we were made in His image. We were made to thrive. We were made to love Him and to love others. We forget, and so we get caught up in shame and pain, and we we lose sight of who we are and what we're doing, and we forget that we belong to Him. Amen? That we're loved by Him. We forget all about it. Peter needed to be restored, right? He needed to remember who he really was and what he was really supposed to be doing. He needed more than anything to find his way again. He needed to overcome the regret that was gripping his life, and what he discovered is that the only remedy for regret is forgiveness. And church, you need to hear that this morning. The only remedy for regret in your life is forgiveness, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, forgiveness. I want you to notice what happens next. Jesus and his friends are sitting down over breakfast. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to step out on a limb here, okay? So just follow me. Jesus and his friends are sitting down over breakfast, and I'm not exactly sure what's happening, but I like to think that Peter is trying to come up with a scheme about how he's going to fix this with Jesus, right? He's had two opportunities. He knows he's missed the boat, and he knows he's not going to have this opportunity over and over again, right? And so, so there he is. He's at breakfast, and he's trying to figure this out, and he's thinking through all the ways. Jesus knows what's going on in his brain, but he also knows Peter. He knows that Peter's a prideful guy, right? And he knows that it's going to be really hard for Peter to stand up and apologize for what he's done in front of all the other guys. And so notice what Jesus does. Jesus reaches out and offers him forgiveness. Jesus initiated the forgiveness. Just soak that in for a minute. He didn't wait 
for Peter to get this right. Because he knew Peter was going to have a hard time getting this right. Well, yeah, we are. Yeah. And so he offered forgiveness. And he did it in a way that only Jesus could do it. Three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter is quick to say, Jesus, you already know the answer to that question. Now I want you to notice, Jesus never said, yes, Jesus, I love you. He said, you already know that I love you. That pride just, I don't know, that's how I saw it. I saw this pride just welling up inside of me. He's like, Jesus, let's not talk about this right now. I mean, the guys are here, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't want them all to know what we're doing here, right? Because isn't that how we are, guys? It's the crazy stuff we do. But that's Peter. He's like, you know what? You already know Jesus. And he's got the eyes, laser eyes right at Jesus, right? Jesus already knew that he couldn't go there, right? He knew that Peter needed to really say something else and that he couldn't get there. And so Jesus doesn't hold back. He offers forgiveness to Peter anyway. Despite his pride, despite his fear, despite his hesitancy, Jesus offers Peter forgiveness anyway, right? And every time he gives Peter an instruction, he says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Remember who you are, Peter. Remember what I've called you to do, Peter. You're not who you think you are. You're not who you used to be. You're somebody new because I've redeemed you. Because I'm alive, church. Because I'm alive, you're not any longer who you once were, and I forgive you. I, want, I wanted so, so much at the end of this story to hear the rooster crow, right? Because all I could think of is the rooster crowing after Peter for the third time denied knowing Jesus and Peter weeping bitterly as he ran out of the garden. And I thought, man, wouldn't it be sweet justice if the rooster started to crow right now to remind Peter not only of what he'd done but what was being done for him, amen? Wouldn't that have been beautiful? What a great reminder that Jesus redeems us and sets us free and makes us whole, right? He was redeeming Peter. He was restoring Peter to himself. He was making all things new. He was making all things right. He was offering Jesus, Peter, forgiveness and reminding him once again of who he was and what he was supposed to be doing. I love this. And the reason I love this so much is because it reminds me that because of Easter, because Jesus is still alive, that I can be forgiven, church. And that you can be forgiven. Amen? You can be set free this morning. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can have new life. See, Jesus' resurrection was for Peter, but it wasn't just for Peter. It was for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, for, for you. It was for you, church. It was for you and it was for me because Jesus came up out of that grave. Because Jesus beat death and sin, we can experience forgiveness. We don't have to live with regret. We don't have to let shame define us anymore. We don't have to be victims. We don't have to run back to the empty places in our lives that we think are going to fill us up and that fill us up for a, a moment, but then we leave more empty than we ever were. We don't have to go back to those places, church. We don't have to forget who we are, but we can be restored and renewed and set free. We can find new life because Jesus is alive. Amen? He is still alive, and because He is, we can find forgiveness for our own stuff. Now, here's the deal. I want to remind you of this again. This all started with Jesus. He initiated it all. Paul says it like this. He says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Turn to your neighbor and say, he didn't wait for you to get it right. Aren't you glad? <laughs> I'm so glad because the truth is, if he'd waited for me to get it right, it had never happened. Absolutely. There's, a, there's somebody speaking from experience, right, Bobby? <laughs> right? Because the reality is, I could never get it right on my own. And neither could you. He came, he suffered, he died, and he rose so that we could be free, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could remember who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. Because Jesus lives, you can be forgiven. A couple of years ago, I read a story about a kid named Scott in Time Magazine. Scott was a 13 year old kid, and 
13-year-old kids. How many of you remember having a 13-year-old kid? Anybody? How many of you are a 13-year-old kid? No, I'm just. <laughs> right? So I remember when I was 13, I was a little mischievous, and I was a little bit of a troublemaker, right? And we all can remember either, either we were or we know somebody who was. Amen? And so this Scott was 13, and he thought, you know what? I'm going to do the cool thing. And, and he snuck into his dad's room after his dad left for work one school morning, and he stole the gun out of his gun case. And he brought it on the bus. He wanted to show it to his buddies. He wasn't going to hurt anybody. It wasn't his intention. He just wanted to show it off, show him how cool he was. So there he is on the bus, and he pulls out that gun, and he's showing it to his buddies, and he didn't know it was loaded, and he fired this thing. And when he did, he killed this 13-year-old girl in his class named Susie. Of course, he was arrested, and he was taken to juvenile detention, and he was, and he was charged with involuntary manslaughter, and he's sitting in juvenile detention awaiting trial. And he got the word one day that somebody was there to visit him. And so he came out into the visitation lounge, and he was terrified to discover that it was Susie's mom. Face-to-face -face with the person he'd hurt more than anybody in the world. And, and there he was, and he's like, I don't know what to do. And he didn't even really want to go in, but he felt like he had to. And so he walked in the room. And when Jennifer, Ma, Susie's mom, saw him, she smiled. But you could see the tears welling up in her eyes. And he's like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen, right? And so he's walking up to the table, and as he does, Jennifer stands up, and she walks toward him, and she stops, and she says, Scott, can I give you a hug? And he said yes, and so she reached out, and she gave him a hug, and then she sat across the table from him, and the first words out of her mouth were, Scott, I just want you to know, I forgive you. Amen. And Scott looked at her, and he's like, why? I mean, what have I done to deserve that from you? And I love her response. She said, it's not about what you've done or what you haven't done. It's about what's been done for me. She said, a long time ago, I hurt somebody that I love really badly. Right? I hurt somebody really badly. And before I could ever make amends, before I could ever get back to them to, to try and make it right, he forgave me. He forgave me. He set me free. He, he lifted this burden off of me. And the moment he did that, I was free again. And because he did that, because it was going on in my own life, I, had to, I just promised that I was going to share it with, with somebody who hurt me at some point. So I want you to know, Scott, you are forgiven. He was overwhelmed with emotion and just started bawling across the table. 13-year-old boy just bawling in front of all of his jailhouse buddies, right? Because he realized he had just gotten a gift that you could never, ever take away from him. Now, the story goes on that, that at the, at, a couple of weeks later when they went to trial, Jennifer pushed for a, a lighter sentence for Scott. And then they got to travel to all kinds of places to tell the story about what had happened and about specifically talking about gun violence and gun safety. But, but what I look at as I, tell, as I hear the stories, I think, man, what incredible redemption took place in this situation, right? Because what Scott found out later is that Jesus, or that Jennifer was a follower of Jesus, and because of what Jesus had done for her, because Jesus had set her free when she didn't deserve it, she could turn around and offer forgiveness to him. Amen. The one who'd hurt her more than anybody had ever hurt her. That's an awesome story, isn't it? What it reminds me is that because Jesus is alive, I could be forgiven. Because Jesus is alive, you can be forgiven. Because Jesus is alive, you can be set free. So let me ask you again. I started this message by, Ben, come on up if you would. I started this message by asking you, what regrets are you carrying with you today? And I ask you again, what regrets are you carrying with you today? What is it that's holding you back, that's keeping you from moving forward, that's, that's shaping and molding your life maybe in a really negative way, that's causing you to run back to places that are really comfortable, that keep you, from, that keep you hiding from the thing you need to deal with? Because Jesus is alive, you can be set free today. Amen? Amen.